use that kind of example when the city wants to do something to get people to see this is time and again as a community we can come together and relive that spirit maybe in another event maybe in some other way it doesn't matter but the, the games are the anchor for that idea that the spirit can live on you know the one wonderful thing is that you know, the Olympic Games are complicated. They're not easy to put on. There's a great debate that rages for years, but you cannot find anyone today in the city that thinks it's a bad idea. Because to say it's a bad idea is to criticize yourself. Because everyone owned the Olympics of Vancouver. Talking about owning uh, the Olympics, we will have uh, three successive games in Asia, starting with Pyeongchang and then uh, Tokyo 2020 and Beijing uh, 2022. And uh, I would just like to hear from uh, Mr. Sermyang Nge. I hope I pronounced correctly or something close to this. What is the perspective of the other uh, Asian countries and uh, as uh, a member of the executive board and a member of the IOC, uh, what are the legacies that the other countries in Asia, they see from the successive three games uh, in Asia and how you building this uh, together? Uh, thank you, Tanya. I think you already look at um, the uh, uh, Pyeongchang, Tokyo and Beijing. You could even go back a little bit uh, earlier to 2000 Beijing, uh, 2010 Singapore Youth Games, 2014 Nanjing Games. So we are talking about six games taking place uh, in Asia over this short period of uh, 10, 15 years. So there's a lot of games. Uh, there's a lot of uh, legacies, plans of individual cities as well as the countries. Uh, but I, I think in addition to this, uh, this really uh, gives uh, Asia, in particular East Asia, a great boost uh, in the sense that when you plan for legacies, uh, it need not just be for the city, for the region, for the country, it could also be a greater part of uh, uh, Asia that can be involved. Uh, I, well, we, this this uh, legacy, for example, for Pyeongchang, it's not going to be, uh, the, the, the plan is not going to be finalized until uh, the uh, discussion in, in the, uh, December by, by the Korean government. Uh, but again, uh, the, the, the decision on, on, on what, is, what the shape and form is going to be finalized in, that could also already be thinking about uh, Pyeongchang legacy is not just about Pyeongchang. If you look at Pyeongchang after Pyeongchang, in particular for Winter Games, you have 2022, which is Beijing. So whatever legacies you have, uh, and, and for Beijing 2022, they already, China is already building hundreds of uh, uh, winter resorts. So whatever Pyeongchang has and will continue after the Games, uh, it could become a destination. It could become part of uh, East Asia legacy. Example of Singapore, many of us uh, would come to Korea for, for uh, uh, winter holidays to ski, to enjoy the sports. And I'm quite sure that uh, and we go to Japan as well. But in this case, with the uh, Winter Games in Pyeongchang, I'm quite sure many Chinese focusing on 2022 would also be making use of uh, Pyeongchang, looking at Pyeongchang as a great uh, destination as uh, even for sports facilities, it could be shared until then and uh, beyond then. So, so I believe uh, when, when you look at legacy in this very unique case, where six games, four Olympics and uh, two youth games taking place, uh, there's a lot of things where you can really work together uh, and, and which is happening with uh, Pyeongchang, Tokyo and uh, Beijing now. Moving from Asia to South America, <laughs> my next question is to Mr. Barter, that is currently writing his thesis about the legacy of the education program of Rio 2016. 
We are one year and a few months after the games. I know it's early to make any uh, final judgments on the legacy of the Rio games, but uh, I would like you to, to share with you your main conclusions so far about this specific legacy that is the one on education. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. First, uh, I would like on behalf of the Dream Together Master students to thank the Seoul National University, the Korean Ministry of Sports, Culture and Tourism and KSPO. As Derek mentioned, for us it's an amazing opportunity to be here. It's an emotional time for some of us. We are about to leave the country, but I'm sure we will go back much more prepared to face the challenges of sports. And about the Rio 2016 education program, there is something very particular about the country. We all know it, Brazil is the football country. If I ask here, like, name three Brazilian persons, probably most would say Ronaldo, Neymar, and Ronaldinho. So we had this challenge of increasing the number of sports practice, especially in public schools that don't have the resources to include different sports. So if I had to choose one main legacy aspect of this education program would be that we were able to take sports such as badminton, rugby, tennis, that are in Brazil considered very elitist sports to people from low community. And then during the games, they would watch the sports on TV and they would say, hey, I played this with my friends in my school. So this for us, it was amazing. We reached around 8 million students from 12,000 12, schools in the country. And I'm kind of suspicious to talk about it, but I would, mention, I would say it was one of the best initiatives, legacy initiatives of the organizing committee. Uh, moving from education to technology, <laughs> we hear a lot uh, something that uh, it's in common on the presentations of uh, Pyeongchang and Tokyo is the role that technology plays in the legacy plans of the two games. Uh, so I would, this question is to both uh, Mr. Kin and uh, Mrs. Uh, Na Nawamura. <laughs> Uh, Kawamura, sorry. Uh, it's about the technology and innovation. If you could you please explain the opportunities that the Olympic Games bring in this area because we know that both countries, South Korea and Tokyo, are very advanced in relation to technology. What it changes with the Olympic Games? Uh, what are the new opportunities that are opening for you in this area that's very important for both the economy and the society of your countries? Thank you, Tanya. And uh, yeah, as you know, the, Japan is the famous for the cutting edge technology, but we would like to more and more, you know, their technology innovations come, you know, the people's dreams come true. The Olympic is the best opportunity to introduce their, you know, their unknown technology and innovations for the first time. It's good excuse for the people and the public and also the co very easy to communicate always their, um, how can I say, like a ventures and also to try to, you know, much more proceed their technology. But one thing is very important is, I always believe one innovation needed to 100 people's behavior has change. You know, if, even if the new innovation of technology, you know, introduced to your life, but you know, the people cannot use it or utilize it, so there in, it's almost nothing. So, I believe the people need to, you know, their uh, combine their usage and the convenience of the new technology and the innovations. So to think about the building the better society with innovation and technology taking opportunity for the Olympic Games, and also their, you know, the 
the technology and innovations can be introduced to all areas, including, as Daniel mentioned, like educations and the cultures, and also, you know, the old life's well, with hair, uh, with welfare, and all things you are connected. So we we don't chase the fancy, not only the fancy fancy things. We just think about to you know to improve their more well-being, the human lives. Yeah, I was in the Olympics in 성화봉송을 저희가 진행을 했었습니다. 그때 이제 이승엽 선수가 막 MVP가 돼 갖고 저희가 이제 같이 가서 뭐그 성화봉송도 하고 그랬던데 그때 제가 깜짝 놀란 게그 일본의 이제 도요다 자동차가 스폰서였는데 내비게이션이라는 게 생겼습니다. 아주 시골에서 저희가 대부분 그 교회에서 성화봉송을 했는데 지도 하나 갖고 이제 그때 그 내비게이션을 활용을 해서 찾아다니는 게 굉장히 그, 그 당시에는 처음 저도 그걸 본 거여 갖고 신기했죠. 그런데 지금 와 갖고는 그 기술이 굉장히 이제 대중화가 돼 있고 저희 그 삼성 같은 경우도 이제 그 당시에 나가노 올림픽에 처음 스폰서로 들어갔는데 그 당시에 일본에 핸드폰이 없었습니다. 기술 방식도 달랐고 그래서 그때는 일본의 엔티티 도코모의 핸드폰을 받아서 브랜딩만 삼성으로 해서 그렇게 하던 시절이 있었습니다. 근데 벌써 지금 세월이 이렇게 흘러 갖고 삼성의 글로벌 넘버 원 네, 경쟁을 하는 이런 단계로 기술이 테이크업이 됐거든요. 그게 이제 올림픽을 그 계기로 해 갖고 아, 탑 브랜드라는 그런 인식 또 그거 그렇게 가기 위해서 기술 개발 이런 것들이 이제 따라간다고 세, 생각이 됩니다. 그래서 이번에 이제 평창 올림픽에서도 이제 그 제일 저희 그 우리 대한민국 입장에서 또 KT라는 기업 입장에서도 어, 그 ICT 올림픽에 주, 맞게 5G 기술을 적극 적용을 해 갖고 어그 통신망을 그 이번에 이제 올림픽에서 그 적용을 하고 또 UHD 그그 그 중계를 그또 실시를 하고 또 공항에서 이제 로보트가 길그 올림픽을 안내하는 그런 것들 그다음에 여덟 개 언어 서비스 그 앱을 개발을 합니다. 그래서 그 앱을 통해서 이제 그 통역 서비스를 받을 수 있게 한다든지 아까 얘기했던 그 지금 평창에 이제 경기장은 완성이 됐지만 각 방송사에서 엄청난 중계 시설들을 지금 설치를 하고 있습니다. 거기에 적용되는 기술들, 뭐 이렇게 아까 뭐 얘기했던 홀로그램 VR 이렇게 해서 각종 문화 공연 또 대회 운영 이런데 엄청난 기술들이 적용되고 있고 기업들이 그걸 이 올림픽을 통해서 업그레이드를 하기 위해서 노력을 하고 있습니다. 특히나 이번에 아시겠지만 탑 스폰서로 알리바바나 인텔 같은 아주 초그 테크놀로지 기업들이 참여를 하고 있는 것은 그만큼 올림픽에 참여하는 기술적인 측면에서 뭐 비즈니스적인 측면에서라든지 활용성이 올림픽의 가치가 크다는 것을 어 보여주는 게 아닐까 그래서 이번 저희가 5대 목표 아까 말씀드린 5대 목표 중에 ICT 올림픽을 구현하는 그런 그 평창 올림픽이 되지 않을까 그렇게 생각을 합니다. And we can understand it much better today than we could see it, for example, one year after the games. Uh, you have a great success, but there were also challenges in this uh, in this path. And how did you find solutions to these challenges? And what you think could be useful, for example, for Pyeongchang that is approaching uh, the games and will have to face those challenges in the near future? Thank you. Um, one or two questions there. <laughs> um, so I think in terms of, of, the, of the timetable, um, in London, uh, as in uh, everywhere now, uh, we move at a high pace. The world is, is fast-paced and everything 
uh, is expected to be delivered quickly. So as I said in the presentation, people expected the legacy to be delivered uh, immediately. They expected the park to be open immediately. Um, and I think part of what you have to do to maintain a degree of optimism and enthusiasm is to be able to, A, show that you're moving as quickly as possible, because just because something takes a long time doesn't mean that you should spend as long as possible doing it. You should do it as quickly as possible. So we showed a combination of what we would call quick wins in London, um, and we got the bits of the park that we could get open, open as early as possible. We got the bits of the venues that we could change, changed as quickly as possible. So as I said in the presentation, we had some, some momentum. I think about what happens when you move from short term to long term was that our first sort of big short term change was that two years in, all of the sporting venues were open and being used by the public. And to some extent, a lot of people, and in particular the media, thought that that was legacy. So it was done, the job was finished. And what we have to do to maintain enthusiasm and to maintain, maintain a connection is to find new ways of telling the story. So if you just try and issue a press release every week that says, legacy is great, here's something new, people get bored. So we find big opportunities when something really significant happens to announce that. It's an announcement in its own right. Um, and we use that to remind people that this is what came out of 2012. This came out of the money that you paid in your taxes. This came out, as John said, from the commitment that you made to make London a success. And we tie in what we're doing on the park with something really big. So this summer, when we had the IAAF World Athletics and, and the IPC World Paralympics Championships, we had the world's media back on the park. And what we got was lots of documentaries and news footage, not about the event themselves, but people who wanted to see how the park had changed from when they were there five years ago and all the things we'd already achieved. And that maintained a huge amount of enthusiasm at home and in the international media because people could see the before and after. And it, uh, that credibility allows you to keep doing more. We have had uh, challenges. Everybody has challenges. And I think there's two things that you have to do to deal with those challenges. Firstly, you have to be proud of what you've done and you have to be committed to what you're going to do and you can't allow those challenges to get in the way. There, in any project, and we all know from delivering a games, there are really, really difficult obstacles and sometimes it's just, just really hard work to get through them, but you do get through them. And I think for us, kind of some of those legacy uh, issues have been about the, the speed at which we're building the houses um, or some of the problems that we've had when we changed, uh, when the politicians changed their mind about the plan for the stadium and we were going to have a, a stadium that was deconstructed and then we decided to keep it. And, and that causes issues. And I think you have to keep going back and sticking to the plan. But in order to maintain that confidence, it goes back to that point about telling the public what you're doing and why you're doing it. And if you're confident in the plan, you always, you always get through it in the end. I think the really, really tough issue will come to us over the next few years because we've had a five-year story that started with 2012 and finished with the 2017 World Athletics that was about sport and sporting venues. We now have to tell a very different story, which is about how we're building on that to deliver new jobs and, and new houses. And that looks more tenuous. That's harder to connect to a sporting event. So what we have to do is to work really, really hard. We will know in 10 years if we've been successful or not. But the really cr critical issue for me is always being able to tell that story that's fresh and new, not just telling the same 2012 story over and over again, but when you tell that story about this amazing new company that's come to the area, or, or the fact that, for example, Ford Motor Cars have brought their innovation hub back to East London, which ties in with the incredible industrial heritage of an area that invented uh, petrol and invented plastic, there's a new way of telling that story that people buy into and when you do it, that's when you remind them that if it wasn't for 2012, that, that, that wouldn't have happened. So trying to be clever in the way that you do it, refreshing and renewing your story, but always reminding people of the golden thread that runs through from where you are today to where you are a few years ago is really important for keeping that interest and that momentum. And now I, I, it's the same question for everyone. So if we do a round the table, starting with Mr. Rowe on uh, clockwise uh, sense. 
If you had one single learning that was really important for you from your experience or your studies that you could share with Pyeongchang right now about the legacy, what would you share with them? The one learning to sh uh, I'd like to share with Pyeongchang is to make uh, the public, including the Olympic City citizens and uh, the Korean nation as a whole, feel proud of their games. How? The people uh, should feel that uh, the, through the games, the games uh, they contribute greatly to development of the region and the country as a whole. And, and also, uh, the, through the games, the people could have the great joy and ha feel happiness. Uh, by that point, uh, the important thing is to uh, the Korean Olympians in Pyeongchang Olympic Games uh, should have a great result, for example. That can give the people great joy and happiness and high spirit. That can keep the Olympic legacies after the games keep alive for a long time. I think I would go back to something that I said uh, in the presentation, but if there was one lesson that I would draw is not about what the legacy is, because every games has to have a legacy that's right for it. You can't pick up someone else's legacy program and say, do that because it's meaningless in another country, another city, another context. Um, you must do the legacy, that, the program that's right for you and what your country needs, what your city needs, and what is relevant to the location. The thing that I think is universal is making sure that you have built in not just the planning for legacy, but the delivery of legacy, and that there is someone who works alongside the organizing committee, maybe inside the organizing committee, but that's their job to do legacy. It's not their job to do games delivery. It's not their job to, to do preparation. It's not their job to manage the world's media before the games. It's their job to plan for and deliver legacy and to make sure that they're going to be the person and the team that delivers it when the games is finished and the world's uh, spotlight has moved on. And I think if you have that ownership and you have that responsibility and you know that you've got to look the politicians in the eye and even more importantly, the public in the eye afterwards, and you've got that responsibility, you will take ownership of it and you will make it happen. And I think that's something we did in London. It's something we learned from other cities. And I think it's always the thing that we pass on to others. Have someone who owns it and make sure it's their job to deliver it. I think the most important uh, thing for Pyeongchang now is to make sure that they organize uh, very successful games uh, f for the start and that the, the people in South Korea are really enthusiastic about it. They are proud of the organization. They are proud of the athletes' performance. Then the, the rest of the legacy uh, would sort of follow. Uh, and uh, the second point is just that Pyeongchang uh, would look at themselves as not serving just Korea, but the, the region, then some of the issue with uh, the overcapacity uh, would, would sort of become a, a smaller problem by itself. So I think it's Olympic game is the all about sports. So, you know, the uh, Pyeongchang game, you know, the year should have better to communicate always uh, public to the sports as, you know, the people, uh, the speakers mentioned about the Every single, you know, the people has their own story related always to Pyeongchang uh, Olympic Winter Games, right? So I think it's their very great opportunity for their, uh, the South Korea and also the Asian people and all over the world can have opportunity to have uh, stories related with their, uh, the winter sports. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think, you know, a word that um, I remember uh, using a lot in the early days of when we were bidding for the games was the word humanity. And I, when I was studying and preparing and, and trying to succeed at being awarded the games, I remember, you know, talking about how the Olympic Games was a, an opportunity for a country to make a contribution to humanity. And 
um, and I think sometimes in the, in the midst of all of the um, great challenges that happen, we forget, and that w when all of the, you know, we, we build and we have legacies and all kinds of things happen, but in the middle of all of this, we are supposed to leave a mark on the soul of the world. And at the opening day of the Olympic Games in Vancouver, um, I learned something that I think I had taken for granted, and it was this. And a young, a young boy was killed in an accident. And it was a, the most, it, for me personally, it was the worst day of my life. And it really shook the games at its soul. And I think many people thought the games might fail. But what happened when that happened was the, the, the human side of the Canadian public became exposed. And Canadians rallied around the organizing committee and supported us and urged us on and urged us to use the moment, this terrible moment of adversity and grief to demonstrate what the Canadian spirit was all about. And I think one, the, the lesson for me out of all of this is to let your own community become your friend, to become your partner, to invoke the spirit of your own country to help deliver the games so that at the end people feel that that they, when this is all gone, that they have a connection, a re something that you, that you all did together. That it wasn't some organizers in Pyeongchang who did this, but all of the country came together and did a great thing for Korea and a great thing for the world at the same time. And to me, in the face of adversity, that was the best lesson for me about how powerful your own public can be and the contribution they can make to what the world takes uh, from your Olympics. Uh, well, my very humble suggestion would be for Pyeongchang to invest in evaluation. I think that, as Professor Kang mentioned in his speech, many legacy projects are under-evaluated. And in that way, we lose opportunities to tell good stories, to justify the money we're spending on this, to help future organizing committees. And most of, of, most of the evaluations are descriptive. Numbers of participants, number of events, number of buildings. And this is not the only way, it's, it, this is the superficial way to measure the real impact of these legacy programs. So I would suggest invest a little bit on evaluation because this, I think, will help to tell Korean people that these Olympic Games were, were, were worth the investment. Well, thank you. Um, as a student of sports and um, somebody who loves Olympism, um, I think the Pyeongchang 2018 should, should be good, but has to go beyond just a sensational fortnight feeling. Um, it has to kind of like focus on it has to focus on kind of like drawing a benchmark for other countries to follow. And then secondly, as much as possible, it has to ensure that every step that is being taken to ensure that the legacy is fulfilled is, is followed. Because um, as you know, we have various um, ulterior, uh, how do we call it, um, extraneous variables that come in in terms of management. So as much as possible, they have to stay focused um, try not to be divided by politics or any other thing, and just stay focused to the, um, the legacy that they've outlined. Because I believe every carefully planned legacy is good, but the problem is implementation. So once the implementation processes are followed, then we can experience a very um, sustained legacy for generations to come. So thank you for inviting me to Kang Jin-ho and Seoul. We are going to the Olympics today. This is a very important part of this conversation. We are going to be able to get the most important part of 뭐 여기 계신 분들 알겠지만 그동안에 이제 정치적인 그 
이슈하고 갑자기 대통령 선거가 치러지고 뭐 이러는 바람에 저희가 더반에서 유치할 때 국민 지지도가 90%가 넘었는데 어, 최근에 뭐 50% 내외 어, 과, 어, 그런 사태를 거치면서 근데 지금 이제 조금 나아지고 있습니다. 그래서 티, 아까 말씀드린 대로도 저희가 11월 1일 이제 성화봉송이 들어온 후에 저희가 이제 정보 검색을 해봤더니 3일 사이에 이제 그 올림픽 평창 올림픽 건수가 5천 건 이상이 검색이 되고 어, 성화봉송에 참여 거리에서 참여한 사람들이 80만 명이 넘습니다. 그리고 이번에 저희가 이제 디지털 캠페인으로 해서 어, 대통령과 식사 경품을 내걸고 이제 캠페인을 시작을 했는데 거기에 하루에 5, 5만 명 지금 일주일 사이에 한 30만 명 이상이 어, 들어왔고 그래서 조금 분위기는 그러다 보니까 이제 잘 아시겠지만 이제 평창 롱패딩 뭐 그런 거 해서 저희 웹사이트 가입자 숫자가 하루에 시, 요 최근에는 만 명씩 막 늘어나고 있습니다. 그래서 분위기는 전체적으로 괜찮아지고 있다고 이제 생각을 하는데 그럼에도 불구하고 처음에 올림픽 유치할 때에 비하면 아직 숫자가 못 미칩니다. 그래서 어, 그런 면에서 저희가 이제 국민들이 참여해 갖고 어, 그걸 통해 갖고 이제 자부심을 느낄 수 있게 아까 차관님이 어, 메달 얘기도 하셨는데 대한체육회에서 이제 금메달 여덟 개, 어, 은메달 네 개, 동메달 여덟 개 목표를 가지고 있습니다. 그래서 그런 것도 좀 성, 같이 이루어져서 어, 그 평창 올림픽이 올림픽 자체가 열기가 있고 사람들이 참여를 해야 그걸 통해서 이제 자부심도 느끼고 거기에 따른 역시 물적인 거 시설적인 것이 어, 사후에 활용되는데도 더 가치 있게 국민들의 지지를 받아서 그 이루어지지 않을까 그렇게 생각을 합니다. 그래서 어, 앞으로 많은 몇달안 남았지만 77일 남았는데 많은 성원을 부탁드립니다. 땡큐 미스터 킨 Uh, I would like to open uh, the floor uh, for questions uh, for the public. If someone would like to to ask something. Hmm. Hello. Good evening. I am Omer Asif from DTM program, and I'm from Pakistan. My question is from Mr. Miang, IOC Executive Board member. Uh, what do you think from the past to future the indicators and methodology IOC used to measure the legacy of Olympic was it effective enough and uh, do you have some strategy to improve these indicators and methodology in the future? Thank you. Uh, I uh, couldn't quite hear the whole question. Huh. So my question was, uh, from the past to future, the indicators and methodology IOC used to measure the legacy of Olympic, was it effective enough? And what is the plan or strategy for the future to make it more effective? Thank you. Uh, good question. Well, I think, uh, as I also mentioned in my speech earlier, legacy uh, is uh, different to every uh, uh, games itself. So the city, when, when you talk about legacy, is start on the vision that they have, when, when the, the very reason, the very core of why they bid for the games. So the success or failure of the, the, the legacy itself uh, again depends on, on each uh, uh, case. Uh, so what we are doing now is uh, we will be more proactive in helping the cities to look at this very important area of legacy from the bid phase that will continue into the organization if they are successful and will continue working together with them uh, a, a number of years uh, after the, the game is over. Uh, so, um, so I think in, in, in that way, we will make sure that it, it is a complete and thorough process of laying, laying the foundation for the cities to, to achieve their legacy. Uh, and, and we will fine tune our, our strategy as, as we uh, go from games to games and, and these uh, evolving things uh, and 
So, so it, it is a partnership arrangement that, that we have with, with the cities. Next question. Uh, good evening. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Ted from Zimbabwe. My question is directed to the Vice President of the Pyeongchang Organizing Committee. Um, are there any challenges that are being faced in managing the Seoul uh, Olympic uh, legacies? If they are, what strategies have been put in place to ensure that these challenges are not going to be faced again in managing the Pyeongchang Olympic legacies? Thank you. Jaga. 어 사실은 여기 오차관님이 <웃음> 서울 올림픽을 담당을 하셔 갖고 그그 부분은 조금 얘기를 해 주시고요. 평창 부분은 아까 말씀드린 대로 이제 아직 그 전체 그 운영, 시설 운영 주체 저희는 이제 조직위는 아시다시피 아이 올림픽이 끝나면 이제 한 2년 안에 이제 그 해, 조직 자체는 해산이 되고요. 그 관리를 강원도나 이제 이 정부에서 어떤 조직을 꾸려 갖고 운영을 하게 될지를 결정을 해야 되는데 그 부분이 아직은 결정이 안 돼서 제가 그 답을 아직 하실 수는 드릴 수는 없을 것 같고 서울 부분에 대해서 조금. I uh, most of the the sports facilities which were used for the Seoul Olympic Games are still are used uh, the, uh, very efficiently uh, still by not only by the elite sports people. Uh, but uh, the ordinary people for sports for all movement. Uh, the, sp the special thing is, to, uh, I should remark on uh, at this point, uh, we have established a special organization which is called uh, Seoul Olympic Sports Promotion Foundation. Uh, that the special the organization they included the people who worked for the Seoul Olympic Organizing Committee and also uh, the special the corporation uh, is running the special sports fund, as I mentioned in the, my presentation. Uh, it's very useful uh, sports body, along with the Korean uh, Sports and Olympic Committee. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Chan Hyun from SNU. Um, from the previous presentation, I could learn about how well the previous Olympic host countries and cities hosted their events. And I could see uh, from Speaker Kamra, uh, Japan's decent plan for the future events, 2020 Tokyo Olympic, focusing on technology and social innovation. And a 5G technology was introduced by Juho Kim, and as a result, I learned um, there is a difference of, a uh, of the trend of planning a mega uh, event um, from development of an area to technology. So my question is, what other factors and differences uh, can be mentioned in the future? Thank you. Um, I'd like to hear from um, any of you on the stage. <laughs> Thank you. We didn't uh, hear very clearly your question. If you could re repeat, please. Uh, <clears throat> so um, I saw uh, there is a difference of, um, of, of, of the trend of planning on mega events from development of an area to technology. We're focusing on technology these days. So what other differences or factors can be introduced in the future? Um, okay, I think uh, the, the, the concept of uh, games for the future, uh, there are a number of things that is taking place. Uh, some cities like London, they bid it for the games because they want to regenerate one whole area, which uh, would be very slow and almost uh, impossible. 
under the, the normal political circumstances for funding uh, and, and, and for a, a city planning to be arranged. So, so that was the, the driving force. And um, the, the, the philosophy nowadays is that if you, if you can, you, you make full use of existing facilities. And, and so in some cases, uh, the cities would not need to build as many. But for some which are new cities, maybe, uh, developing cities, probably they will have to, to, to build more. So infrastructure development would still be important for this type of city that will be being in the future. Uh, for mature cities like Tokyo that has hosted games before, uh, they are sync and, and they are technologically uh, the, the probably the top in the world. So, so their concentration is not so much of a, a thinking of uh, infrastructure development as a legacy uh, because they, they, they have existing one which needs to be renovated and in some cases some will be uh, adjusted to, to, to meet the game's requirement. So their concentration is on technology. And as you know, the, 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 the world is moving so fast in uh, social, economic, uh, technology, and so on and so forth. So we don't know what new, new sort of thing will come out. Maybe uh, now we are talking about sharing economy. So maybe the, the next cities could be coming out with a legacy on sharing uh, economy. So, so I think it's, it's an it's a in interesting question. But we're also living in interesting time. And the games after that will be 2032. So 2032 for summer games. I don't know what's going to happen. I think technology people probably can, 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 can say more about it. Uh, and the next game, uh, winter game, will be 2026. Uh, so uh, that, I think, will be a little bit more uh, tradition as, as we have now. Uh, so so uh, th this is my take, uh, looking from the IOC point of view. Thank you for your questions. Uh, I'll, we will get an, one more question from the public, and then because of the time, just give the opportunity for each participant to give the final uh, thoughts. Hello, uh, my question is, how can we convince the society that legacy of Olympic Games is equal with the financial cost. For instance, Brazil spent a huge money to host the Olympic Games while there are many poor, poor people there. So how we can convince the society that legacy is equal with the cost of uh, Olympic Games? Thank you. I'm not gonna answer the whole question just about Brazil. In the case of Rio, my opinion is you can't. The costs involved in organizing the Olympic Games were not similar to what we got from it. So all the, the speeches we heard were positive because I do think the, these other Olympic Games left more legacy than Rio did. So I have a more negative opinion on the other legacies of Rio. So. In my opinion, in the case of Rio, this proportion is not uh, balanced. I'll just uh, give a different view here. It's important to remember that a big part of the funding of the games in Rio were private, uh, not just uh, for the operations and the, the sport venues, but a big part of the infrastructure that stayed for the city receive some private money that would not come for the